Thank you. It's a real honor um, and very humbling and certainly tests the limits of hospitality of the uh, English department to have me here. So thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> Simon Critchley, a uh, philosopher, uh, once said that philosophy begins with disappointment. And we might say that of the humanities, uh, that the humanities begins with disappointment. That is, in some way, um, we get disappointed in religion or in society or in politics. But this disappointment is really useful because it means we want something more, that we can imagine a different type of world. It's um, the possibilities of a utopia, right? The idea that like Moore's utopia, it's a non-place. But it's a non-place, it's a place of the mind that we want to realize, that we want to bring into existence. Now, uh, Nietzsche, at the beginning of um, Birth of Tragedy, uh, says that the Greeks had a pessimism of strength, which is to say that they believed that it was hard to look into the abyss of life, that life is dark. There's like a, what Eugene Thacker calls a cosmic pessimism, that Life is, life is hard, but that what art provides us is an, a veil to look into the abyss. So uh, he says, for both art and life depend wholly on laws of optics, on perspective and illusion. Both, to be blunt, depend on the necessity of error, which is to say that we can, we can hold up this veil that, that reason, reason, the Apollonian reason, that light shines a light onto the abyss, and it's hard to look, it's hard to see it. But art allows us a veil by which we can tolerate and imagine another way of being. It's what Isabel Stingers call, says in, a, uh, she says, another world is possible. It's in a book called Capitalist Sorcery. Her idea is that capitalism, in some ways, is planting a flag on the future. But, we might ask, what is the future's future? One of the things that the humanities provides is the ability to imagine a future's future, a future that has not, had its, has not been claimed by others. The idea that there is disappointment, but another future is possible. And what the humanities allow us to do is to imagine those features and to try to realize them. In terms of realizing them, and I'm reminded of uh, Heidegger in an essay called uh, Building, Dwelling, and Thinking. And he says basically that um, before we build, we dwell, which is counterintuitive, right? You think you have to build something in order to dwell. But in fact, he says, no, we dwell, and the way we dwell determines what we want to build, right? In other words, we think about the ways that we dwell now, and we build from that. So the idea of the humanities is to imagine other ways of dwelling, other modalities of being, other ways of comporting ourselves, of carrying ourselves in the world whether it's a Shakespeare festival um, for kids who hadn't imagined that as possible, or other types of activities that can be realized in a world where another world is possible. What Heidegger says is, dwelling and building are related as ends and means. However, as long as this is all we have in mind, we take dwelling and building as two separate activities, an idea that has something correct in it, Yet, at the same time, by means and end schema, we block our view of an essential relation. For building is not merely a means, a way towards dwelling. To build is in itself already a dwelling. So we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to dwell? How are we going to build from that idea of dwelling? Because in doing that, we, we allow new things to emerge. 
right? So it's sort of like when you write that paper, you have ideas you had no idea you were going to have. And in writing that paper, new things appear, new things emerge. And then in actualizing those possibilities, you allow new connections to come forth. And that's sort of what the humanities allow us to do, is to take those things that hadn't existed before out into the world and to create new connections and to allow them to be unveiled or to emerge. And in doing that, to provide a sense of care, an ethics of care for a future or for a future's future. Now, um, this, granted this is awards and graduation, but in some ways it's a strange ceremony that's a placeholder. Like, I'm just a placeholder. There were people who, Mark gave this talk last year, before him, Tara Eisen, and on and on. And there will be futures of other people. Paul has done it. <laughs> okay. and, and then in the future, there will be others who give it. So I'm just this placeholder. And in other ways, you're just placeholders. Like, there are people who graduated before you <laughs> here to remind you of that. And there is a future of other people who graduate. And so what we realize in that is that we're occupying a space that is a space of culture, of those who came before and those who will come after, that is passing on these sort of cultural markers, not only for ourselves, but for a future or for a future's future, and trying to help them imagine the possibility of that utopia, of that non-place, of what might be possible for a future, to help it emerge or to be realized. Um, now, there's a band called Kraftwerk. Um, there's an old German band that did a lot of electronica. And they had a, a, uh, a song called Antenna. And it went like this. I'm the antenna catching vibration. You're the transmitter giving information. Then the lyrics loop. I become the transmitter, you become the antenna. And it loops again. It inverts itself, and then it inverts again. The idea being that we are continually passing on in this cultural game of transmission and reception. It's structure and thematics. This is something that the author Tom McCarthy noted in his essay, Transmission and the Individual Remix. <coughs> one can begin to write, he says, if one is already writing. One can begin to think if one is already thinking. But we could say, who is this one? A culture that comes before us and that goes ahead of us, a language that precedes us and that will outlive us, of which we are participating in and shape. It gives us this possibility for a pessimism of strength, to sort of take language that is our house of dwelling, to bend the bars of that poetically, and to imagine other futures. Or as uh, Vladimir says to Estegon in uh, Waiting for Godot. So Waiting for Godot, Godot never shows up. But he says, I can't go on. I don't know if he's even saying it to Estegon. Perhaps he's half saying it to himself. I can't go on. I can't go on. I'll go on. Right? Or as Beckett says in his uh, long poem, Worst Word Ho, Try again, fail again, fail better. <laughs> Many times at the university, we're taught to master things. It's the whole goal of the university to graduate, to have, show mastery. But I think one of the keys that humanities allows us is to imagine also vulnerability. And in a world that is increasingly changing, that has to be sensitive to ecologies of change, to imagine vulnerability is to imagine ecologies that are not just human, but beyond the human, utopias that are participating with other environments that are non-human. 
I'm looking at Joni Adamson, who's very involved with that. And I thank you, Joni, for all of your work and in, in, in all of that. Um, I'm reminded, finally, I'll talk very briefly about um, one of the shortest poems in the English language. It was um, Ogden Nash. Uh, initially, they thought the shortest poem was by Ogden Nash. Uh, it's uh, called Fleas. Fleas. Adam had him. But then um, uh, Muhammad Ali uh, spoke to Harvard uh, graduating class in 1975. And they had sort of egged him on to provide a poem. And he said, me, we. So I'll leave you with that, and congratulations, the class of 2016.